só sangue. Father, we thank you because you brought us together by your spirit through your love. We thank you because of your confirmed love for every one of us. You have chosen us and selected us to be useful in your vineyard. And Lord, we are praying that your purpose of choosing us will be fulfilled in our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that these days we have come together to spend at your presence in fellowship with you and with one another will get the best from you in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we are praying that nothing will hinder us, Amen. that nothing will debar us from getting the best from you, Amen. that you will deal with us as your own children Amen. on individual basis, Amen. that, Lord, the goal you have before us 
and the purpose you have in your own heart concerning every one of us, that these days of fellowship with you and with one another, you reveal more and more to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Make us wise. Amen. Keep us away from all foolishness. Amen. And Father, we pray that you will help us too, that we will see far ahead of us. Amen. That things that lie hidden in your own heart, you reveal to our understanding in Jesus' name. Amen. That Lord will not only be working and planning for the time that now is, but will be planning and working for the future that's in your heart. Make us what we ought to be. Amen. And help us, Lord, in the ministry you have given us that will accomplish your perfect will. Amen. Bless us together, O oh Lord, Amen. so that when we go back, we'll be channels of blessings for other people. Amen. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. We're looking at Mark chapter 4, from verse 14 on through to verse 19. The sower soweth the word, and these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately, and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. And these are they, likewise which are sown on stony ground, who when they have heard the word, immediately receive it with gladness and have no root in themselves, and so endure but for a time. Afterward, when affliction or persecution ariseth for the word's sake, immediately they are offended. And these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the lust of other things entering in, choke the word, and becometh unfruitful. Looking at the program sheet in your hand, you'll see that I'm talking now on learning and gaining nothing. The topic seems negative, but actually the purpose is for you to see how to learn and gain something. But it's put in that negative way so that it can awaken you to the realization that it is possible to learn and not to gain. So you can make up your mind that you will learn and gain. Now, if you look at the average fellowship, especially the average fellowship in Deeper Life Bible Church, you'll see that every Sunday our preachers prepare and they preach powerful sermons. Then on Tuesday or Wednesday or Monday, whichever the case in your own district and local government area, we have a Bible study. Again, there is the message of the Word of God that goes forth. Then at another day, Thursday or Friday, as the case may be, you have the revival hour. And so if you think about all the weeks in the year, that means we're preaching messages about three times every week. And then for 52 weeks, you have more than 150 messages. Now think about this, that most of our preachers preach these 150 messages all alone by themselves. And these messages are generally revelations of divine truth with life-changing power that is preached every year. And yet the average preacher himself remains the same in December as he was in January. Why is it that a man will preach 150 powerful messages? even if he did not listen to other messages preached by other people. Why do we preach up to 150 messages, or perhaps 100 messages, that are well prepared, well thought through, and then well delivered to the members of the congregation? And these members of the congregation, they come back with testimonies, and they say, I've been changed. My life has turned around, or I've been healed, or I've been delivered. And yet, the preacher who preached the messages himself remains the same in December as it was in January. It must have meant that he, as the preacher, learned so much during the week through the outlines and the concordance and the helps and the Bible dictionaries, and then he put all the messages together, and yet he learned and gained nothing. 
Now, the average worker in deeper life is exposed to messages of the Word of God. All these three messages I spoke about every, every week, uh, the average Christian worker in our church is exposed to. But more than that, the average speaker is also exposed to another meeting, an extra message, perhaps on Saturday in the morning, afternoon, or evening, as the case may be in the state or in the district. That means four messages every week. And when you multiply that by the 52 weeks of the year, that means you have more than 200 messages. And yet, are they are not Christian workers that listen to these messages every year. And yet, from year to year, there is no remarkable change. They remain weak. They remain unproductive. Why? It must mean that somehow, these workers are learning, and yet, they are gaining nothing. There are others among us who not only listen to the messages preached by the pastors of the local church or the state overseers of our states, but they also listen to cases that have come from the headquarters church in Lagos here. There may be people that listen on a regular basis, that maybe they listen to a cassette a week. Now, that adds on perhaps about 50 other cases or messages in the year. Now, already now, these people we're talking about, they're listening to almost 300 messages every year. And yet, they do not appear to have any effective change in their lives. Then, apart from that, they study. Because we have many of our workers that carry these big Bibles. Thompson's uh, Chain Reference Bible, or Dick's Annotated Reference Bible, or some other big Bibles with study notes that we carry about. And then we have some other books that we read. Books from uh, the Deeper Life uh, Bible Church. And also books that we have bought from the bookshops. Some good, powerful books that we sometimes read. Although many of us, when we begin these books, we're never able to actually get to the end of any book. Most people will start a chapter. If they go to the second chapter, they might be uh, one of the lucky few that go beyond one chapter in a new book that they ever start to read. But some of these that even go beyond the first chapter, where is the change in their lives? So then it means that for most people in our church, and of course if we go beyond our church for the majority of Christians all over the world, it looks like we're always learning and yet not gaining much. We listen to messages about marriage, and yet we can develop a better relationship. There must be something that is accountable for that. We're always listening to messages on faith, and yet there is no improvement in prayer power. We're listening to messages on grace, and yet we struggle today, as we struggled six months ago, with our Christian lives. We listen to messages on love and fellowship, yet we suffer from isolation and frustration which means that there is no change. These messages that are powerful have not actually made definite changes in our lives. And we learn about God, about Christ, about the Holy Spirit, yet we never seem to know enough to do exploits. Why is the common experience of most workers and preachers like this? That's why we're looking at the reason why many people learn and yet they gain nothing. In the passage that I have read to you, which is uh, the interpretation given by Jesus Christ himself of a parable he had given out, he mentioned three types of receivers and three types of hearers. He said in verse 15 of Mark chapter 4 that these are they by the wayside where the word is sown. But when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Jesus emphasized that where the word is sown should be in the heart, in the heart of man. Man is made up of body, soul, and spirit. But in the learning process, we talk about the soul, the mind, and the heart. When you talk about the man, you talk about the body. But then when you are talking about the body, you are talking about a lot of 
other things. But when it comes to learning, you learn a lot of things in life. The information that you receive from your neighbors, from your friends, from colleagues, from a teacher at school, you receive into your mind. And with the mind, you are able to logically arrange all those thoughts and all those ideas. And this makes you to be able to logically present one thing or the other to other people the way you have understood. That's receiving it in the mind. But then there are times when the thing you have received touches your soulish realm. It touches your emotion. It, touch, it touches your feeling. You hear that thing and if it's a bad information and it comes into your soul, it makes you feel sorrowful. If it is something that um, makes you feel excited, a good information that pushes you, excites you, yet that is in the soulish realm. But when Jesus talked about receiving the word of God, he said it's not planted in the soulish realm just to affect your emotion. Neither is it planted in the mind just to make sure that it has gone into your brain and you are logical about it. It says it was sown in their hearts. And so if what we're hearing never goes beyond the mind, eventually we don't actually get many things that we feel that we're getting. We don't gain because it doesn't go beyond the mind. Or if it doesn't go beyond the soul, we only felt about it. You felt excited. You felt happy. Or you felt sorrowful. Or you even felt grieved. Or you felt convicted. But it has not sunk in deep into the heart. And the heart has not soaked in that which you have heard. It has not gone into the center of your being. Then eventually, Satan comes and he takes it away from your mind, from your brain, from your intellect. And then the word seems unfruitful, unproductive. That is why the educationists in the world have said that we need to repeat something six times over before man will actually begin to understand and before man will actually be able to grip or grasp what you are saying. Actually, it's only when you begin to practice or you begin to act on what you are hearing that it becomes more meaningful unto you. But the point is this. There are people that have no time to meditate upon the word of God that they are hearing. And therefore it never passes beyond the, sub the surface or the superficial realm. Because of that, they do not gain much from what they are hearing. And it is so easy to hear 50 messages a year, 100 messages a year, and not to allow that thing to soak into the center of your being not to have time to meditate, not to have time to cover it up in your heart until it becomes part of your system, part of your thinking habit, or part of your deep life within you. Then it says that some fell among the stony ground. They have heard the word. Immediately they receive it with gladness. Now you'll see that word gladness there just uh, talks about the superficial thing that we feel. How many times in your own uh, circle, in your own fellowship, you have preached perhaps some faith? And our people, they understood what you were saying, and God gave you some revelation, some faith, and it was very deep. And maybe you yourself, you have never gone into that type of revelation before, and the people could see that this was beyond the ordinary. Because of that, they shouted, they were joyful, they clapped. And they really meant it. Even the people that will normally be cold and not clap and not respond in any emotional way to a message on faith, they expressed their emotion and they were very, very happy. And coming out of the meeting, they said, I never heard that before. I've listened to that same uh, passage before, but our pastor has never preached like that before. And you know, I'm so surprised that our state overseer or our pastor or district um, supervisor could bring out such a deep insight or revelation from the word of God on faith like that. Very, very happy and joyful. And then all of a sudden he says, I know now that I'm well. And there was no doubt at that time. And the emotion was so deep and the gladness was so real that momentarily the sickness was not even felt. 
But then the second day, all that emotion wears off. And the sickness is real now. And then he comes back, and while seeking for counseling, it is like he never had a message on faith before. But was glad yesterday it was in the soulish realm. It tickled his intellect. His ear stood on edge when he was hearing. The composition of structure of the message or the word appealed to his emotion. And because it was just in the soulish realm and that gladness was there, he was very, very joyful and excited and he went back home thinking that if I meet the devil on the way now, I'll crush him. But the devil doesn't appear when you are glad like that. He knows it's all emotional and he's going to wait until the emotion is down. He knows that thing doesn't reach down deep into your heart. And he knows that when a little difficulty arises, when a little problem arises, that thing is going to get off the soulish realm. You just wash it off like you wash the dirt off every morning. Or when you sleep, and then it's gone off your memory, and you've forgotten everything. You wake up the following morning, and it's as if there was nothing there. But do you know? When somebody tells a lie on you and somebody told you that you know that somebody slandered you and told a lie on you, what do you do? You receive it, you sit down, you stop all activity, you meditate on it, you say so and so, so it could say so much about me. While you are meditating on it, the thing is passing from your brain. In fact, the brain is no more, the brain is no more involved now. The thing is passing from your will and from your mind. The mind is no more involved now. Temporarily, it is in your emotion. You are sorrowful and it's in your soul. But at night, while you are still sleeping, you couldn't even sleep. What were you doing? You are meditating on the thing until it drops down to the center of your being, to your very heart. When you wake up the following morning, what's the first thing you remember? The thing that has passed in your heart. That slander, that lie, that deceit that somebody did against you, that thing must have been terrible. Then you think about it all day, and all night, and all week, and all month. Even when you pray, it's difficult to get that thing out of your system even by prayer. Because it's something you meditated upon. If you had done the word of God like that, then it would be difficult to get it out of your system. This is the reason why many people, they do not gain anything. They do not have enough time to meditate. Neither do they have enough prayer to transfer the knowledge from the mind to the heart. From the head to the heart. From the soulish realm, the emotional realm, to the real spirit, the center of the heart of man. And then it says in verse 18, these are they which are sown among thorns, such as hear the word, and the cares of this life, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the loss of other things entering in, choke the word, and it becometh unfruitful. Jesus talked about sowing a number of times. There was a time Jesus spoke about the husband man that sowed wheat in the field. But the enemy came at night and sowed tears among the field in the field at the same time and then both grew together and the tires will choke the wheat many times when you hear the word of god then you also hear other things our problem is that we're not always hearing the word of god alone we're hearing the word of god and we're also hearing other things now you know on sunday People come to hear the word of God, but before they come, they hear other things. And after they have come, they also hear other things. And all these other things are words. They come in the, in the form of information, in the form of instruction, in the form of ideas and words. And the word of God they are hearing in church maybe on Sunday or Monday or Tuesday or Wednesday, Thursday or Friday, they also hear in form of information, in form of instruction, in form of words. The wheat is sown. The tires are also sown. And you know, if you are like the average person, more tires are sown than wheat. And because of that, the tires will grow up and choke the world. And as we're in this workers' uh, retreat as well, now it's impossible for us not to receive other words. 
you hear the word of God. But before we came in this evening, while you are in the hostel, some word has already been sown into your heart. It may be good words, maybe a word of testimony that will assist the word you are hearing. It may be a word of encouragement that uh, you are hearing about revival in another stage. It may be a word of instruction that uh, this is what I did and that's how I overcame that problem. And if you do the same, you'll overcome your problem. But unfortunately, it may not be a word of instruction or a word of encouragement. It may be a word of slander, discouragement. Or it may be a word of uh, reproach, that somebody reproached you. It's unfortunate like that it is like that in the household of faith. Or that somebody gossiped against you, and you are hearing it from a third party. And because already since you came in today, some word has been sown into your heart. And this is being sown now. And there's competition between what was sown before and what is being sown now. And after we have left this place, we'll go to the dining hall, we'll get to the hostel, we'll get to the bathroom, we'll get to the various places we'll be going, and some words will be sown in your heart. Blessed are those people who only have words of truth, words of faith, words of encouragement sown in their hearts all through this period. But it will be unfortunate for you and for us as a body. If somebody after you have received the wheat of the word that should actually be productive in your life, if somebody will call you aside and say, open your heart. Let the land be available for me. I want to sow some tears in your heart. Some slander. Some lies. Some terrifying statements from the devil. Let me sow them in your heart. And then afterwards, you can go tomorrow morning and hear another word again. But I've not finished my conversation. After you have heard the tomorrow morning's message, come back. I want to sow some more tears in your heart. Because I do not want you to come to this workers' meeting just hearing the word of God alone. I have some words, private, personal, although dangerous and destructive, I want to sow in your heart as well. It will be unfortunate if somebody acts like that to you. He'll smile like a friend, but he'll be sowing the seed of Satan in your heart. Do you know that's why people learn and they gain nothing? You know, if we could instruct people that come to the church and tell them when they come on Sunday not to hear anything at all except the word of the Lord alone. And after the Sunday worship, not to hear anything at all except the word of the Lord alone. People will grow faster than they have been growing. But... How can we instruct them? They will hear other words. The thing for them to do is to know that they'll have firm decision to meditate only upon the word of God. Then we're told in that Mark chapter 4 verse 19, the cares of this world. The cares of this world. They make us to um, learn and to gain nothing. And sometimes these cares of the world are legitimate like uh, the mothers that have come with their children who will tell them not to care for their children that will be an unrealistic individual and that will be a wicked person that has no compassion and love for children and we have to care for those children but you know sometimes even the care for the children can turn into be cares of this world now as we're here there are many times that our own stomach will tell us that we're hungry. Now who will tell us not to eat? That will be an unrealistic preacher or pastor. But then sometimes the care to eat and to find things for ourselves to make us feel convenient, that will be like the cares of the world that can take us away from the hearing of the word of God. Now if um, it happens that you've been having business in Lagos, it's so natural and it's not something completely sinful uh, to have a concern because uh, you know this is the only time you are in lagos and you think that now if i can just think about that business or see that business partner or somebody i wrote to long ago uh, to help me find out an information about a company in lagos well it will be unrealistic to say that it must never cross your mind at all but these are the innocent things legitimate things that become the cares of the world in our hearts 
And sometimes if you have been going from stage to stage and you've been carrying on business of selling, selling books, selling clothes, selling some legitimate things. Now, the Bible does say that he that does not work must not eat. It's legitimate to work. But you know, sometimes some of these things that are legitimate, innocent, and proper can become cares of this world for us. And because they become cares of this world for us, they choke the world. We become absent-minded. We're not able to actually get in what the Lord wants us to get in. And so the world becomes unfruitful, unproductive in our lives. At other times, uh, there are people that you are concerned for. Maybe they have never come to workers' meeting like this before. And um, you know that they are in the fellowship of other children of God, but you know that sometimes um, some of the other children of God, they are not very wise. They are not very controlled in their conversation. And you care for these people that are just brought to the workers' uh, meeting. You don't want some people to pollute their mind. And you are trailing them. You are watching over them. Sometimes that's legitimate. Because um, it's not everybody that is standing firm or standing right in a workers' retreat. And therefore you want to protect uh, some worker, precious worker that you brought. You want them to get the best. And you are protecting them so that they don't get involved with any type of gossip or slander that will not make them to get the best from the workers' meeting. That's legitimate. But sometimes even that can become cares of this world. And deceitfulness of riches. Riches. Many times it's uh, the things that you prize most. That for you is the riches. That will make you not to benefit from the word of God. And you know sometimes it's not only money. Wealth is not just money. Wealth is uh, whatever it is you are desiring to make you fulfilled. That will say, now this is what I'm looking for. Some people are not interested in money. There are some of us who, uh, we don't count money as the greatest thing in life. You know, sometimes it's even church growth. I hear that my friend now, his church has become 700. And then I heard that my friend, the other time that we came into this place, just started in that local government area, and his church was just about 230. Now he's saying that the church is more than 400. And it's that appeal to you, and rushing on and running after, how my church will become 400 or 350 or 500, as the case may be, that is the riches that is uh, occupying your attention. And because of that, the real thing that God wants you to have, you are missing. The seedfulness of riches, or it may be money, unfortunately. That the love of money will become for you the thing that pierces you, and the root of all evil, in your own case, or desires for other things entering in. Other things entering in. You know, our foolishness is that we don't understand that whatever we desire, many of these things we can get if they are promised by the Lord through faith. But because we're not looking at God alone, we're looking for how we can get these things without having faith. We want a shortcut. And therefore, the desire for these things will choke the word in our hearts. Eventually, we become unfruitful. But for some other people, it may not be what I have said now. It may be despising the channel of communication. You know, if you look out through the Bible, Israel was never allowed to choose who their prophets will be. In their foolishness, they chose who their kings will be. But the prerogative of choosing prophets, the channels of communication with the children of Israel, hearing from God, they were not allowed to choose their prophets. Now, when they chose their kings, God, by his permissive will, allowed those kings to reign. And he accepted that, well, they have chosen him, they have chosen him. After all, most of the work of the king is administrative. And because of that, God said, all right, let him go on, lead them to the battle, administer justice in the nation but when it came to the office of the prophet he never allowed them to choose prophets 
But didn't they choose some prophets? Yes, they did. All the prophets they chose became false prophets. God never spoke through them. He never gave his word to them. For kings, he allowed them to reign. But for, for prophets, he never allowed them to become the channel of his message. All the people that he passed his messages through, he chose them himself. And so, many times we despise the channel of communication. We want to choose our own prophet. We want to choose our own communicator. And we say, if it's so and so, if it's so and so, then I will receive. But God doesn't allow you that indulgence for you to choose your own prophet. Any prophet you choose will eventually become a false prophet. And the reason why many people did not gain when they were learning much is because they were despising those channels. Other people, it's because they did not form the decision to obey. This word of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you'll meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that I have commanded you. We must decide to obey. God doesn't speak just to give us information. God doesn't speak just to give us head knowledge. God does not speak just to make us have um, ourselves become reservoirs of knowledge. He always speaks so that we'll be able to obey. For other people, it's because of unbelief and hardness of heart. For others, it's because they are committed to tradition. And if the traditions in their hearts, some erroneous views they have got, conflict with the word of God that has power to change life, if the traditions conflict with the word, then they stay with the tradition rather than with the word. What then shall we do so that we learn and gain something? So that we don't become like these people we have read about in the Bible that learned much and yet they gained nothing or gained little. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, 2 Timothy chapter 3, from verse 5, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with divers lusts, ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There have been people like that before, ever learning and yet never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. But what do we do? So that we'll avoid this situation. There are many references of the Bible, but um, we don't want to spend too much time tonight. I'll just give you the point. One, break up your fallow ground. You'll know your heart. And you will know how you receive the word of the Lord. You'll know whether it is just on the surface alone. Whether it is only in the soulish realm alone. And you'll know whether you have come to the habit of judging a message and benefiting from a message temporarily only when it is paired with emotion. If it's like that, it means that your heart has been left uncultivated for a long time. The simple, basic truth of the Word of God, without the emotion and without a serious logic, will not be appealing to you. If that is the case, your heart has been left uncultivated. Hardness of heart might be your problem. And it may be that um, you have been unawakened for a long time. Then you yourself will break the fallow ground of your own heart. That means that you'll meditate upon the word of God deliberately. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take discipline. It's just like the people that are trying to pray on their own for the first time. They kneel down, their hearts are wandering. And their minds will go to this, this and that. They're not able to concentrate for five minutes on their own. And if you have been like that, it's going to take discipline. And you must break yourself loose from that destructive habit of just wandering about. 
and then you cannot take the word of God and benefit yourself. Or when you have heard the message of the word of God like this, except people around you are shouting and praying and crying and screaming, you really cannot wake up. The, your habit is to sleep off or to wander off after hearing the word of God. That means that your heart has been left uncultivated for a long time. You do not know the heart of meditating. You do not know the method of getting the benefits of the word of God. Now you must break off that fallow ground. Generally when things are like that, there will be some things that are covering your heart. There will be some things that have deceived you and hardened your heart. You must remove them. And you must sit down in prayer or kneel down in prayer and say, God, why is my heart so cold like this? Why doesn't truth touch me? The Holy Spirit is so far away that he doesn't even apply the truth in my heart. And then you repent of that state of mind. You are sorrowful for that state of mind. And I say, Lord, you must deepen this effect of the message upon my heart. And all the hindrances will be taken out of the way. Two, you must repent of wrong attitudes. Attitude to the word of God saying, I'll hear another message tomorrow. The one I've heard today, that one is not strong enough yet. That's not what I was expecting to hear tonight. And I hope that I'll still get another message that will stir me up. You must repent of that wrong attitude. You must repent of the attitude of looking for what you want, but taking what God has given. You must take what God has given rather than looking for what has not been given and what God has not deemed fit to pass across unto you. Repent of wrong attitudes. The sadness of heart, repent. If you neglect the word of God after you have heard the word of God preached from the Bible, if you are still going back to God and saying, God, speak to me. I want a dream. I, I want your literal voice. That's the wrong attitude. Repent of it. God will never speak to you beyond this word. If you are waiting for your own prophet and you will not take the prophet that God has sent to you, the channel of communication, repent of that attitude because he is not going to allow you to choose your own prophet. Otherwise, you will end up in false prophecy and false messages. Repent of all those attitudes then have a strong desire to know him more without thinking of personal gain. Have a strong desire to know God more without having or thinking of personal gain. You'll never know an individual in the real sense if you are having the mind of knowing him or knowing her so that you can have a personal gain. Now, if you, if you know people, even ordinary people, even sinners. The moment that they see that you are trying to get interested and you want to know them more so that you can get an advantage over them, take an advantage of them, maybe get something out of them, they shrink, they withdraw. And whenever God sees that you do not want to know him for who he is, you are not hearing his word for who he is, but you have an ulterior motive. You have something that you want to gain something that uh, you have at the back of your mind and if it were not for that thing that you actually wanted from God you will not have anything to do with the workers retreat. If it were not for I want to get that healing I want to get that money I want to get that position I want to get that authority if it were not for that really you are not interested in knowing God more only because of what you wanted to gain if it's like that you must repent of that attitude because God is not going to reveal himself for those who just want to use God as a stepping stone. That means actually the thing you are looking for is your God. The healing is the God. But you want to use the God of heaven as the stepping stone to get the healing. That's all you are interested in. And after you have got what you really want, then you throw off God and the word of God. That's the wrong attitude. You repent of that. Or if you are looking for money, and you say, well, all I'm looking for now is that uh, I just want to come to this workers retreat. They're always talking about secrets of success. And all the things they're talking about, I know they'll be talking about their church growth and 
how the church will grow. But there are principles that I can take out of uh, the principles of church growth and then apply it to business growth. If that's what you are looking for, the Holy Spirit will not apply the truth to your heart. The Holy Spirit has a monopoly on the truth. He withdraws it from some people. He gives to some other people. Haven't you found people that have said that they have fasted for 40 days and yet they can't get a deep understanding of the word of God? They can't have God talking to them. You know why? They were fasting for something. Not that they are seeking God. They are seeking something. Instead of God. Seeking something ahead of God. And what you put ahead of God becomes to you a greater God. And that's idolatry. And because of that, God will not reveal himself unto such people. They may fast. Have, have you found people that have got a lot of faith books in their homes, in their studies? And they read all those faith books. And yet, after reading everything and fasting so much, they do not have the faith. And they wonder why. At the back of their mind, they're reading those books so that they can get this instead of getting to God. Instead of having God as the chief aim and the chief purpose that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Instead of that, they want another thing in place of God and ahead of God. And they may read all the faith books in the world. The Holy Spirit will not quicken the truth they are reading. He knows they are selfish. He knows they're looking for something ahead of God. And there's nothing ahead of God. He says, I am God, and there's none else. There's nothing else. So have a strong desire in your heart to know him more. Without thinking of personal gain. Look at John chapter 5. Verse 44. John chapter 5, verse 44. How can ye believe? Which receive honor one from another. And seek not the honor that cometh from God only. When you come to that situation, that you seek for the honor that comes from God only. The honor that comes from God only. When you come to that position, that situation, then actually you receive much from the Lord. But if you are seeking for honor one from another, you are seeking for a position of authority, you're seeking for a particular privilege above other people. And the reason you're seeking God is because you're seeking something else. The honor, the position, the riches, the wealth, the authority, whatever it is. Then God will not reveal himself unto you. You may even fast for it. God knows you are not fasting for his glory. You are fasting to receive something that is so dear to you more than God. And so... If we're going to get the best out of the workers' retreat, we must seek to know God more than ever before. And then have a fixed purpose of heart to obey the truth and to please God. Have a fixed purpose of heart to obey the truth and to please God. And have that fixed purpose to the point that if it severs you from anything and anyone, you are ready, like Moses. He wanted to obey God so much and honor God so much and please God so much that he did not count the privileges of Egypt as anything. And because of that, even though years came over years, yet God revealed himself to Moses like he did, like he didn't to anybody in his own generation. Then have, make no diversion. Or have no diversion to make provision or excuses for the flesh. Many times the flesh will want you to make provision. What we call flesh is um, sometimes just self. Flesh in the New Testament is not the body. It's not the bone. It's not the flesh. It's not the uh, tissue or the blood system. Flesh in the Greek uh, or the Greek word just means the self-life. And many times um, our heart, our lives, our emotions unconsciously will make room or provision for self. We'll try to protect self, try to provide for self, try to pamper self, try to sympathize with self, try to have self-pity, and try to have pride within. 
And because of that, because of the diversion we make, to make provisions for the flesh and for sale, really God is not able to speak to us. We're too much involved with ourselves that he cannot get involved with us. When you see an individual that is get, getting too much involved with himself, thinks about himself from morning till night, and any, everything that happens in life, everything that happens at the workers' retreat, he translates it to, how does that show me enough respect? How does that touch me? How does that affect me? What that person said, how that person moved, what th that person did, how does that give me honor and respect? How does that feed my pride? If you are too involved like that, God doesn't want to stay any anywhere around that person. And everything that you do, from seeking a seat, to seeking a plate of food, to taking a bucket of water, to greeting an individual, or to responding to another individual, or to doing anything at all, even the way you see it, or the way you open the Bible, or the way you approach people, you respond to people, you first of all consider, if I approach him like this, how does he respect me? How does she respect me? How does he know who I am? When you make too much provision for the flesh like that, God doesn't want to get involved with you. You're too much stuffy. And you're full of self. And your heart is clouded. Everything you are thinking, you don't have a way of God penetrating through you. That is why many, many people that are crying and that are saying that, well, I don't know why God has not given me this. I don't know why God has not given me this. They're too petty. And uh, because of that type of uh, pettiness, because of thinking of self all the time, how it affects me, how it respects me, how it honors me, how it gives me what I want, how it makes the people to know that I'm so and so. Because of that, they're not able to get through to God. Well, they may pray, even when they are praying. It is so that people will see how prayerful they are. They have not blotted off all the ideas and the praise of men out of their hearts and out of their lives. And because of that, it's difficult for God to penetrate and to get through to them. But make sure that you don't make any provision for sale or give excuses for the flesh. That links up to the next point. Let there be humility in your heart. Humility is not something that is outward, that is external. It is of the heart. And first of all, you humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. If the humility is not in the heart, any other type of form of humility uh, amounts to hypocrisy before the Lord, and that still separates you away from the Lord. Then there should be discipline in meditation and prayer. Discipline in meditation and prayer. If we do all these things, then the Lord himself will bless abundantly at this workers' retreat. But... If we don't, the Lord himself might hide from us what he reveals to other people. In Hosea chapter 10, Hosea chapter 10, verse 12, Sow to yourselves in righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground, for it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. All through this time, let's uh, know that he wants us to break up the fallow ground. So in righteousness, seek the Lord until he comes and he rains righteousness upon us. You've seen that from the word of God, it is possible to learn and gain nothing. And yet, it's so possible to learn and gain much. You decide which one you want. If you don't decide, that's already a decision that you don't want to gain anything. If you don't awaken yourself and um, tell yourself that this time is serious time and it is not for business, it's not for just ordinary fellowship between brother and brother, sister and sister, and it is not for um, marriage, uh, matching together, looking for who to marry, this is real time with the Lord. All those other things we're looking for. If we seek the kingdom of God first and his righteousness, he knows how to add all the other things unto us. But if we seek the other things instead of seeking God, God will be right not 
to give us those things because we are making them God and to make us have disappointment in the workers' retreat and also in life. You want to avoid that disappointment? Then do all these things that we have said. Make no provision for the flesh. Discipline yourself in prayer and meditation. Break up your fallow ground. Be humble. And you tell the Lord, I have this strong desire to know you without having any material gain or any secular gain or even religious gain at heart. All I want is that I want to know you more. And if you are that serious with the Lord, the Lord will reveal himself more unto you. And this um, workers' retreat will be a new experience for every one of us in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's rise up and pray now. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you very, very much because we know you brought us here to walk in us that the purpose of our calling into the ministry might be fulfilled. Amen. Father, we thank you because you brought us here that you might wash us again and purge us again and purify our hearts. Father, we pray that all these things we have heard this evening, Heavenly Father, we pray that none of them will fall on deaf ears in Jesus' name. Yeah. We, want, we don't want to be hearers only, but the doers of the world. Yeah. And we don't want to be like foolish sowers, but those that sow with wisdom. And as the word is being sown in our hearts, that these things will bring commendable fruits into our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, we do pray you that your hand will be laid upon every one of us, Amen. that by the time we leave this place, we will know that we have heard your word and we have gained something. Amen. Anything that tends to make us not to gain anything after hearing much of your word. Father, we resist it in Jesus' name. Amen. Hardened hearts, stubborn hearts, rebellious hearts. Father, we pray that all such hearts be softened in the name of Jesus. Amen. We pray you, Heavenly Father, that our coming before you this week we will come like new converts. Yes. That are yet to know, even those of us that have cassettes at home, we have books at home, we pray that it will not be like the former time. Yes. But that as you Speak to us. Your word comes to us. That these words, they will mold and transform us totally in the name of Jesus. Amen. Father, remove the spirit of talkativeness from us. Amen. As we have come to this program, that tendency of going around, walking around, Talking and talking and talking until the stars are sown in our hearts and the stranger comes in into our hearts. Father, we pray that only your word will be properly sown in our heart during this time in Jesus' name. Amen. And not only now. Even when we've gone back home, help us to realize that the unconscious discussion with various types of people they are the sowing of the stranger. And these things are the things that actually choke the word of God. When we listen to things that are said on radio, things we read on newspaper, even negative news, negative death testimonies, these things, they choke the word of God. Even the cares of the world, legitimate things, they unconsciously choke the word of God. Father, we pray that from this evening, we all shall be wise unto salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. Father, help us Amen. that none of us will remain as we came here in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we leave this place on Saturday, Lord God, not just having uh, head knowledge, but let us see real 
work of transformation in our inner man in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord, help us. Amen. Even we who are older Christians, help us not to feel we have heard a similar message in the past or that we have listened to cassettes or we have read books like that before. Father, we pray that we'll be able to discipline ourselves in meditation, in study, and in prayer. And that these things will build us spiritually. Amen. Father, we thank you very much. As you have started with us this way, Lord God, we are expecting more. Amen. And not just hearing, but let these hearings get deep into our spirit, get it deep into our soul, and mix up with our brain and everything within us in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you because you have answered. We praise you, Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. Excited today because God has been so faithful to me. I'm going to keep this very short. First of all, I want to thank God for the church. The church has been my family. Um, thank you so much, Pastor Dada. He has been a father to me. I don't start crying. Okay, um, I remember I came here without um, scholarship to Harvard University. The first year wasn't easy, but I got a grant that paid half of my tuition. But then from second year, I got like five different scholarships from my classmates. I'll be graduating in May. I didn't have to take out the board. I just thank God for all his provision. I just bless you with God.